I'm starting out today with a sort of a, a grim story from some respects. It is true though. This happened back in 1862 during the Civil War. President Abraham Lincoln visited some wounded soldiers in the hospital just after a lady had come by to distribute, hand out some religious tracts. And as he came in, he told of his surprise to find uh, one recipient of a tract laughing profusely. The man was laughing so hard that he couldn't stop. And President Lincoln couldn't understand why the man was laughing as he noticed that both of his legs were gone. Mr. President, the soldier said, still laughing. She has given me a tract on the sin of dancing, and both my legs are shot off. And at least the soldier found a reason to laugh. In the early 1980s, there were two movies called uh, Footloose and the other called Dirty Dancing. And they showed teens who felt thwarted by their parents and they centered around dancing as a way of rebellion. Hollywood does have an influence in how society can be changed. Influ opinions can be uh, influenced by the way that topics are discussed in movies and there's no doubt that those movies definitely had an influence at the time. I want us to say today what the Bible teaches about uh, dancing. I hope you have your Bibles near you or one in the pew and can turn along with me. The Bible does mention dancing. The Bible doesn't say explicitly, thou shalt not dance. However, it does deal with certain principles that would condemn some dancing. There are different kinds of dances. Some forms of dances are not condemned by God, while others are. Some dances provoke the anger of God, while others did not. And as I study the Bible, I find at least two very different types of of dancing. Turn to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 20. First of all, there is a celebratory type of dancing that is not condemned. And I want to notice a number of examples of that, first of all. In Exodus 15, 20 and 21, and Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. This is after the crossing of the Red Sea by the miracle of God. Moses led the children of Israel in a marvelous song of deliverance and his sister Miriam took a timbrel, what we would call a tambourine, and led the women in singing and celebratory dancing. They whirled, they leaped in celebration. And there is nothing in the text to indicate disapproval of what occurred here. Now when the Ark of the Covenant was recaptured from the Philistines, Turn to 2 Samuel 6, 13. 2 Samuel 6, 13. 
Here it says, So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedim to the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they bare the ark of the Lord had gone, they that had bare the ark of the Lord had gone six paces. He sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. The return of the ark to Jerusalem led David to dance before the Lord with all his might. Now neither David nor Miriam were censored because of their uh, dances. Neither of their dances had any kind of sexual overtone involved in it. Now we have Judges chapter 11, 34. Judges 11, 34. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. Here's another example of celebratory dancing. Jephthah's daughter did a celebratory dance when her father came home victorious from battle. Of course, completely unaware of the rash vow that her father had made. Uh, we'll go to the New Testament and then come back to the Old Testament. In Luke chapter 15, in verse 25, you have the parable of the prodigal son. And in that parable that Jesus told in Luke 15, 25, now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. Again, in this story that Jesus told, this would be celebratory uh, dancing in the house. This is due to the return of the prodigal son. There are other scriptures that speak of dancing for joy. In Psalm 30, Psalm 30, 11. Psalm 30, 11. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Then in Jeremiah 31 and verse 4. Jeremiah 31 and verse 4. Again I will build thee and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Dancing and singing is a way to express happiness. Now in Ecclesiastes 3.4 we have a passage that we'll be noticing pretty soon in our class on Ecclesiastes. The purpose of this dancing is shown in the contrast there. In Hebrews 3.4 a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. And so this dancing was an exuberant expression of joy felt at some happy occasion. It can be found today after an athletic team has secured a very important hard fought victory and is not sinful. Now I'm going to include, I could have made another category, but I'm going to include under celebratory dancing, some dancing and worship. And we'll look at two passages in the Psalms close together. Psalm 149.3. Psalm 149.3. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and the heart. And then in the next Psalm, Psalm 150 and verse 4, praise him with a timbrel and dance, praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Obviously, this kind of dancing was permitted during Old Testament times. Somebody says, well, dancing is found in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. 
doesn't that make it right in Christian worship today? I'll address that just by two points. First of all, you can't add dancing to the worship of the New Testament church because it's not authorized by the New Testament. If the mere mention of something in the Psalms makes it right in worship today, wouldn't that also, also authorize instrumental music as well as dancing? And what about the burning of incense? Psalm 66, 16. Or even the offering of burnt offerings. Psalm 66, 13. We live under the New Testament law today, the law of Christ, not under the Old Testament law, none under the law of Moses. And so we do not use them today. The truth is the Old Covenant was fulfilled in Christ, Matthew 5, 17. The Bible says he taketh you the way the first, that he may establish the second, Hebrews 10 and verse 9. And the New Testament does not authorize dancing in our worship today. It's so vital that we distinguish between the covenants. And then also we can't add dancing to the worship of the church today and continue to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith and not by sight. And Hebrews 11, 6 says, For without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Christianity is preeminently a system of faith. Upon that vital principle depends all worship acceptable to God. And any act of worship, great or, great or small, has to be a faith to please God. What might we include in the realm of faith? The assembly of the saints, Hebrews 10, 25. The Lord's Day, Acts 20, verse 7. The Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 13, 30, uh, 23, 33. Uh, preaching the Word, 11, 23, actually. Uh, preaching the Word, Acts 20, and verse 7. Prayer, Acts 2.42. The contribution, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Singing, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15. Here are things that are commanded. Well, what would be some things that would not be commanded? Burning incense. Images and statues. Counting beads. Washing hands. Instrumental music. Dancing in worship and so on. Walking by faith excludes... Dancing from New Testament worship. Where there is no word, there can be no faith. Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. No walking by faith equals no pleasing God. So any act, great or small, in the realm of worship and obedience to God must be an act of faith. That's the reason why we don't dance in worship. Even though you have some passages in the Psalms that show they did such in Old Testament times. So, first category, celebratory worship or celebratory dancing. Second category, there is a provocative, a provocative type of dancing that is condemned in the Bible. Celebratory dancing that is not condemned, but provocative type of dancing there that is condemned. Now, I want to uh, say that I'm not speaking of dancing that might take place between a husband and a wife in the privacy of their own home. But rather I'm referring to that which would create lust between those parties that are not married. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.22, Flee also youthful lust. And follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Well, that cannot be done while you're engaging in mixed dancing. Turn to Exodus chapter 32 and verse 19. The idol worship that the Israelites engaged in 
while Moses was up on Mount Sinai, also included dancing in a sensual fashion in Exodus 32, 18 and 19. Exodus 32, 8 says, they rose up to play. That's the same Hebrew word used in Genesis 39, 14, where Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of immoral intentions. Now in Exodus 32, 19, and it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh to the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Their idolatry and their dancing led to their immorality. Their feast was a demonstration of idol worship with all of its sensuality, with all of its immorality. And Aaron allowed the people to do whatever they wanted to do. In verse 25, you have the word naked. That can mean to cast off restraint, but both the Greek and the Hebrew words can mean naked. And many of them could have been naked, of course, as they fornicated. How much of the world around us are engaging in this same kind of naked or nearly naked, singing, dancing, fornicating, and partying such as went on that day. They flaunt their immorality before us and before God. Now turn over to the book of Matthew 14, verse 6. Here's another example of the kind of dancing that is condemned, that is for a provocative purpose, and that's seen in the dancing of Salome for King Herod. I'm going to go to Mark's account in a minute, but this is from Matthew's account. This is Matthew 14 and verse 6, which says, But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. This dancing was designed to incite the lustful passions of her audience, and it worked. The, uh, the entertainment package for the party was not a clown juggling. It was not a girl popping out of a cake. It was Salome. According to Barclay, it is believed that Salome was 16 or 17 years old at this time. And she was the bait that set her mother's vengeful trap into motion. And while Herod and his friends were partying, she sent her daughter from her previous marriage into the room to dance seductively before her stepfather. Lust filled Herod's eyes, pride filled his heart. And Salome was acting here as a dancing girl. I assume that no other women were present because Salome would later have to go outside the banquet chamber to consult with her mother. Now in the great drinking parties of the Roman Empire this period, it would be harlots who often did such dances. Rarely did a woman of position, rarely did a woman of respectability so debase herself. But in Mark's account, in Mark 6 and verse 22, by the introduction of a single word, Mark indicates just how low the mother and the daughter sank in this performance. I noticed that the American Standard Version translates Mark 6.22 this way. And when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod. Grand Opera. While, uh, which enjoys seizing on, on scenes like this, introduced it into the opera Salome in the so-called Dance of the Seven Veils. These dances were suggestive, they were indecent, they were immoral. And we realize that Salome was dancing before them, 
them referring probably to a drunken group of men with eyes full of adultery following her every move. But it what if Herod and the others had danced with her? Would the dancing have been any less sinful? Would lasciviousness have then been nothing more than good, clean, wholesome fun? And what would be the difference between then and now? Now, in this context, we see the effect that dancing had on the male. The effect on Herod, Herod was so pleased by Salome's dancing that he made a promise. In Mark 6, 23, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And you remember what Salome asked for. She asked for the head of John the Baptist. And she got it. He lost control over his own mind. And that same outcome can and too often does happen today. When confronted with such a situation and in such an environment, it makes it very hard to abstain from uh, every form of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Informed students know how often high school dances over the years have been preludes to the drunkenness and immorality that followed on the part of some. In Galatians 5, 24 and 25, they that are Christ have crucified themselves, crucified the flesh, with the afflictions and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Just a few days ago, I read an interview with former Dancing with the Stars pro, Cheryl Burke. Cheryl Burke is 40 years old now. And she ended her 26 season run on the ABC dance competition show in 2022 and she shared her advice for future celebrity contestants to consider before joining that hit network tv series burke said quote be single be single if you do dancing with the stars that's all i'm saying unquote and she admitted to having what she called three showmances during her time on the series. She noted that romances between the Dancing with the Stars pros and their celebrity partners are common. A former celebrity contestant said her husband was concerned about her joining the show since he was worried that she would fall in love with her pro partner. The couple had a big conversation before she agreed to take part in the series. Burke recalled that a former celebrity contestant confessed to her that he had a crush on his pro partner, though they were both married at the time. Though nothing happened between the pair, the celebrity said that even his family suspected that they were having an affair. And when Burke was asked if she fell in love with any of her partners, Burke said that her showmances, as she called them, were based on lust. Well, that sums up the modern dance. It is provocative. It is based on lust. And even the ballroom dancers, like Cheryl Burke, know that by experience. And they know the danger it can pose to a marriage. Well, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5 now. Verses 19 through 23. As we begin to wrap this up, I want to notice three Greek words that must be considered relative to dancing. Three Greek words that must be considered relative to dancing. The modern dancing of unmarried couples falls into a category of practices condemned in the New Testament. 
In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, now the works of the flesh are, manif flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I want to highlight three words that are mentioned in that list. First is lasciviousness in verse 19. Thayer's Greek English lexicon defines the Greek word which Paul used, asogia, as quote, wanton acts or manners as filthy words, indecent bodily movements, unchaste handling of males and females. Well, from those definitions, it's, it's obvious that anything that produces lewd emotions, evil thoughts, or excites unlawful sexual desires is lasciviousness. Does dancing do those things? In a study in which 44 boys who danced were interviewed, 41 of the 44 admitted that dancing caused them to have immoral thoughts and desires. And that word really strikes at the very root of many modern dances because they create unlawful or lustful desire. Not all dancing involves indecent dress or unchaste conduct or illicit movement. We've seen where the Bible records instances of righteous men and women dancing as an expression of joy. However, dancing that calls for close bodily contact between unmarried males and females is wrong. Dancing that involves indecent and suggestive bodily movements is wrong. And dancing that involves impure handling of a dance partner is wrong. This kind of dancing that God's word condemns is the kind of dancing that stirs one to have impure thoughts and act in impure ways. Now there's another word. Look down in verse 21. Here you have the word revelings. It's sometimes translated as carousing. And komoi is defined as revel, carousal, or parties of drinking and dancing. And relaxing proper restraints. Liddell and Scott in their Greek lexicon notes its close relations with music and dancing. Young people would call this partying. My friend Steve Higginbotham said, dancing was included in all of the definitions of reveling that he consulted. For a number of years, brother Daryl Conley uh, who before he died, well, I was on the faculty with him on OABS. Brother Conley preached in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is the center of Mardi Gras in this country. And he said that it was no accident that the oldest Mardi Gras organization in New Orleans is named Comos, after the Greek word for revel. And he said it would be difficult to find a better example of rioting or reveling in the biblical sense than the lascivious parting that takes place in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. And then the third phrase is, and such like, also found in verse 21. He intends to include in this catalog of sins such practices as are of the same nature as those specifically mentioned before, like lasciviousness and reveling. In 1 Peter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22, Neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. 
I want to point out as we conclude, this is not just a young people issue. I once learned of single members of the church attending such dances in their retired years, in their 70s, and in their 80s. Those interested in growing spiritually know that every part of the environment of this kind of dancing would be contrary to their dedication and their commitment to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remember, friends, that there is a hell to shun and there is a heaven to be won. I pray today that you're living for the Lord and glorifying him in your life. If you're not, we want to encourage you to become a child of God, to by faith turn from sin, confess him, and put on the Lord in baptism. Or as a child of God who's not living right, to be mended back to the body of Christ today through repentance, confession, and prayer. As together we stand and sing, we urge you to come. Sassy will sing.